Okay, so let's continue our lecture on the uh, risk and return, right? So in the last video, we started portfolio risk and portfolio return, right? And we can say, you know, if the two stock has the correlation, right, their risk can be reduced, right? If they combine into a portfolio, right? individual stocks risk then can be reduced in the portfolio. That's the benefits of what diversifications, right? If you diversify the portfolios with more than one stock, right? Your overall risk can be reduced. Now I say the formula for portfolio return and portfolio risk, right? And for these matters, right, we are not required to use the portfolio risk formula, right, to do the complicated calculations, right? But if you take the investment course, right, we will study the portfolio risk formula again. Right, so now let's go over these formulas right, for portfolio risk and portfolio return. So let's see here. Right, what's the portfolio's um, return? Suppose we have the two stock, right? Stock A and stock B. And the stock A has spy return R A, right? And stock B has return is R B, right? And also we know our what? We know our risk for each stock, right? Stock A has risk sigma A, right? And stock B has risk sigma B. Right? And we also know the weight for each stock. Right? We, for example, we spend WA right, in a stock A. Right? We spend proportion of our money WB right, into the stock B. Right? So WA plus WB must equal to the 100%. Right? So equal to 1. Right? So what's the portfolio return? Portfolio return is equal to the WA right, times RA plus WB times RB. Right? So it's a weighted average. Right? So we, we already you know, apply this formula right, to solve portfolio return. Right? In the questions we did in the last video. Now let's also check what portfolio risk formula. Portfolio's risk formula. To solve the portfolio's risk, sigma, right, sigma p. This is R p, right. We need a uh, another, you know, input, right. This one we call what? Correlation, right. Rho, a b. That's the correlation coefficient between uh, A and B, right? And uh, I think you have started this one in a statistical course, right? So I will not go to detail for the correlation coefficient. So let me give you how to solve correlation coefficient, right? Use a simple formula, right? Co correlations between A and B can be solved using the covariance a and B divided by what? Sigma A, Sigma B. Right? Now let's solve the portfolio risk. The risk formula is more complicated than our return formula. Will be W A, let me use another colors, right? Will be W A square, Sigma A square, right? Plus W B square times sigma b square, right, plus 2 times what, w a, w b, right, learn what, learn the covariance, right, a and b, right, and uh, once you finish these summations, you take a square root, will be the portfolio's what, Risk, right? 
if we don't know the covariance, but we know the correlations, right? Now our formula will be the wa square times sigma a square plus wb square, right? Times sigma b square plus two times wa wb, right? And the uh, rho ab, right? Correlation coefficient between the a star and b star, right? Times sigma a sigma b, right? So we have the uh, you know three terms, right? In the uh, uh, formulas, right? Let me show you something for this formula. Right? Let me show you something for this formula. Right? Right? For this formula. First, right? First, if the rho equal to zero. Right, so means the two stock right, has a correlation coefficient equal to zero. Right, so means they are independent. Right, in such case, right, this term will be gone. Right, then our portfolio risk will be the square root of the W A S. Right, square right, sigma A square right plus W B square sigma B square. Right, take a square root. Right. And uh, if the uh, rho equal to one, right, then our sigma p, right, this is a perfect square. If they take a square root, will be the w a sigma a plus w b sigma b. Right, so you know, in a special situations when the row equal to one, right, our portfolio risk will be weighted average of the individual stock's risk. Right. However, if the row equal to zero, right, then the third term will be gone. Right. Then sigma p will be w a square r a square plus w b square sigma b square square root. Right. In most cases, as we mentioned before, right. In most case, right, you know our you know two stock are not perfect, right? If a row equal to one, right, sigma p will equal to w a sigma a plus w p b sigma b, right? But in most case, right, rho is not perfect correlated, right? So rho is less than one, right? If a rho less than one, right? Or maybe you can see rho more than minus a uh, more than minus one but less than zero, right? So they are not perfect correlated right, in a both positive sense and the negative sense, right? Our sigma p right because we have the third term, right? Right, you can see here. Right will be W A right, sigma A plus W B sigma B right, plus two sigma A sigma B right, rho W A W B right since this one's not equal to zero but less than zero right so this part the whole you know summations should be less than this one right so our sigma P will be less than the weighted average right? risk of the two individual stocks. Right? So based on this formula's operation you can tell right? when you combine the two stocks into a portfolio, right? our overall portfolio risk will be less than weighted average of the two stocks. Right? Because we have what? We have the correlations right? not perfectly correlated. Right. So with some you know deviations, right? Our stock can be what? Can be formed as a new portfolio right? with less risk than individual stock. Right? But this stock, you know, portfolio's risk right, is in between what? In between sigma A and Sigma B. Right? 
in extreme case, I want the rho equal to minus one. Right? If rho equal to minus one, then our power follows risk will be what? Will be the W A sigma A right? minus W B sigma B will be you know the difference I thought weighted right sigma when we take the difference will be the power follow risk right so when the two stock are perfect negatively correlated right our risk will be very very what reduced right will be take a difference between the weighted risk for these two individual stock right so I don't want you to memorize this formula right and I don't want you to memorize this formula. But what I want to show here, right? I want to tell you because this correlation, right? Because the two stock either moving in the same direction or moving in opposite directions. But when we put them together, right? The risk of the total portfolios will be even reduced. Right? Can be less than one individual stock. Or can be even less than both stock right, when they are perfectly correlated in the native signs. Right, so that's our implications by right, by using the formula. Let's say the detail. Use one example. For example, right, in these um questions, right, in these tables, right, we have the three stock right, and the three assets. I'll be more general. Right, asset X, X Y, and Z. And you can see that. It's by return, right? For each individual's asset, right? They are all 12 percent, right? For these five years. However, if you observe the pattern, right? X return, right? Is moving what? Moving up, right? By two, by two incrementally. But Y's return, right? Is reduced by two percent incrementally. Right, the number just you know bottom up right just change the directions right, you can say if they show this pattern my right, xy will be what will be perfectly right perfect natively correlated right? xy has a rho equal to minus one right means they are perfect natively correlated right but if you look at x and z right all the numbers are what are same right they move in the same same trend and also with the same you know magnitude right? with the same you know values right for different year so x and z they have the correlation equal to positive one right perfect positively correlated right so now let's check the portfolios risk if we add in X and Y into the portfolios, right, and we split our, you know, allocations half half, right, so 50% in X, 50% in Y, right, the portfolios risk will be equal to what? Will be zero percent, right? Because you see, W A sigma A minus W B sigma B. That's our formulas when rho equal to minus one. Here is for the x and y, right? So we just replace a and b by x and y, right? So w x sigma x minus w y times sigma y, right? And then you see the w's are both spotted five, right? And the sigma x one is the you know three point sixteen, the other is also three point sixteen, so they are cancel out, right? So the sigma equal to zero. Right, so one or two stock are perfectly, you know, natively correlated. Right, they are hedging each others in the perfect, you know, case. Right, so their risk will be reduced even to zero. Right, so one of you know economies are in a good conditions. Right, maybe the X, you know, performing not good, but Y were performing good. Right, so they always you know hedging each others. Right, so you can say they are have what they have the zero percent risk right? you can take a uh, calculations for portfolio's return for every year right for example on the 2014 right based on our percent uh, percentage of weight right half half right our total return will be 50 percent times eight percent plus 50 percent times 60 percent right equal to the 
twelve percent. Right? The other years, if you solve the portfolio returns, it's always what twelve percent. Right? For any years, this X and Y asset happen to generate the same return for every year for portfolios. But right? that's why we have the race equal to what? zero. But if you combine the X and Z together, right, in another portfolios, right, you can see X and Z, right, has a what? Has a total, you know, rates equal to the 6.16%. Why? Because their correlation equal to what? Positive one. Right? If a Zo equal to positive one, right, our portfolio's rates, sigma P equal to the WX, sigma X, plus wy sigma y right so 0.5 times 3.16 percent plus 0.5 times 3.16 percent right well just equal to a 3.16 percent so one of these two stock have the perfect you know positive correlations right their risk just equal to the you know individual stock if they have the same risk right so even they are perfectly positive correlated right their race not you know even increased right? even they moving in the same you know way right? with the same value right their race is also not what is not even increased right still maintain the same value as individual stock right so you can say our diversification can add in the benefits right to reduce the risk right in the extreme case when they are perfectly positive correlated Right, the risk is not even increased, right? So why we don't do the diversification, right? If we do diversification, you can enjoy the benefits to reduce the risk, right? So most bond managers, right, they will use the diversification, right, to reduce the risk, right? Because the most asset in a real life, they are not perfectly positive correlated, right? They have some deviations, right? So that's why we can use diversification to reduce the risk. Okay, let's consider two assets. By right? one's asset low, one's asset high. Right? Asset low with both return and risk are lower than the high asset. Right? So what's the performance if we adding these two assets into the portfolios? Right? How we can you know determine the risk and return? Actually, it's based on what? It's based on the correlation. Right? Between these two assets. Right? For example, right, if the two assets are perfectly positive correlated, right, their return will be weighted average, right? Will be you know six percent plus eight percent, right? Divide by what? Divide by two, right? So that will be what? will be you know eight plus six for 14 over two will be seven percent right so that's the middle of their return right as you can see that's seven percent right but if you're adding them right for risk because of the correlations right we know our risk will be the w low right sigma zero right plus the w high sigma high right so the race will be combined together, right? For the two assets will be in between what? Between the three and eight percent. Right? In between the three and eight percent. If the two assets, right, in our case, are uncorrelated, are independent, right? The correlation equal to zero, right? Then return still weighted average, so still around some percent. Our risk will be what? Will be less. Right, will be less, right? And for the perfect negative correlated, right, risk can be even reduced more, right, than the previous two cases, right? So you can say with the diversifications, right, the two assets, right, can reduce the risk, right, for the most case. Okay, now let's say something, right, for our portfolios, right, with more insights right our real last return are usually not equal to the expected return right expected return is what's your expectation about your portfolios right but what you actually get can be different right what you actually get is called real last return 
So what you actually get has a two part. Once you something you already expected, right? So it's called expected component. But some part can be some noise, right? Can be something you unexpected, right? So that's called unexpected component. At any point of time, right? Our unexpected part can either be positive or negative, right? For example, if the market perform better than what's your expectation, then you can have a positive unexpected return. But if the market has a black swan, right? Have a black swan, right? Right? So it means the market go to the downside. Suddenly and unexpectedly, right, you can have a negative, right, unexpected return, right. Over time, right, with the time horizons, right, we know the unexpected part can either, you know, the head and tails, right, two sides of the coins, right. So with the long, you know, long time, or you can say with the toss of coin for many times, right. These two sides can be has equal chance, right. So our average of unexpected return part, right, equal to what? Zero. They are just, you know, cancel out, right? They are have the same value, but with the, you know, positive and negative, right? For both equal probabilities, like right? level, uh, level of, right? So they are equal to a zero, right? They are equal to zero, right? In a long term, in a long term, right? And what's the unexpected part, right? You can see if we have some suddenly, you know, we receive some announcement and some news, right? And this announcement and news can cause what can cause something surprise right to the market right so this one you know can generate unexpected noise right to the market okay so this surprise component can cause our investors sentiment right? sentiment right? sentiment so investors emotion right can cause their to buy greedy or sell greedy of the stock, right? So you can see our sentiment of investors can affect our stock price. Therefore, right return can be also impacted. Okay, so that's for the announcement and news, right? So let's see the next one, right? This surprise is very obvious when we watch the house stock price book when something unexpected happened, right? For example, right, in the last two weeks, right, because, uh, you know, the people's panic about the COVID-19, right, the whole market dumped very quickly, right? And uh, you can see, you know, like the even very good company stock like the Apple, right, and Google, right, the price also dumped very quickly, right, because the market has a panic, right, about the, you know, the control of the disease, right, pandemic disease, right, for the whole national level, right. So that's something we cannot expect it, right. For example, if you're now on the 2019, right, you, you are not you, I think you cannot forecast right, what's going on here right, in the 2020, right? So this is something unexpected, right, unexpected. Right? So this will affecting the stock movement in the market, right? Can cause something called unexpected what? Movement in the stock price, right? In the last month and this month, right, who is the big winner right, in the market is the hedge fund, right? It's some hedge fund measures right, can make a billion dollars right, because they are shorting the stock right, continuously. Right? If they do that on 2019, right, it's, it's not a very good strategy. Right? But for this year, right, because the market dumped suddenly, right, unexpected, right? so these guys do the short positions in advance right, can get a high profit right, from their strategy. Right. I will show you a news right on the backboard where right. you can see how these fund measures make a great money right in the past week. Okay, so compare with our return, right? Our return is the expected part and unexpected part. Similarly, 
our risk also has a two part, right? One is something called systematic risk, right? Systematic risk called a non-diversified risk or market risk, right? For example, if you're listing a stock in the US, right? Your stock will be affected by the whole market performance, right? Such as our national change in the GDP, right? Gross product, gross domestic product, right? This was our economic performance measures, right? And also inflation, right? Interest rate and the others, right? All these macro, macro factors can affect your stock performance, right? This is called a non-diversified risk, right? So even you are a good company, but if you are in the US, right, you cannot inevitable right to you know hide your risk right, from these macro factors, right? So that's very important right, when you do analysis, but this part can never go, right? Even you are in a good sector, right, in a good company, but this part is never gone. The other one was right, called unsystematic risk. Right? What is unsystematic risk? It's something unique right to your company or to your industry right and this is asset specific risk right for example right for the airline companies they are very sensitive to what they are very sensitive to the what to all your price right so this is only specific to the airline industry not specific to the other what industries right for example you cannot say all your price can affect in the amazon or you know Google stock a lot, right? Because they are in different sectors, right? This is all what this all systematic risk, right? Maybe specific to your industry only, right? For example, right, like the label strikes, right? Shortage of the inventory, right? It will be special to your own company or industry only, right? So that will be called all systematic risk. So you can see now we, we put them together, right? Our total return, right, including the two parts, right? Unexpected return and expected return, right? Unexpected return itself has the two parts, right? One systematic portion, right? One unsystematic portion, right? Therefore, our return has the two, you know, third terms, right, in the submissions, right? One expected returns, right, from ex your expectation, right? Then something happened suddenly. Right, in the announcement, right? One is a systematic portion in announcement, one is unsystematic portion in announcement. Right. So the total, you know, adding of these three times up is the total return. Right. So this formula not asking you to solve anything. Right. We want to know we just want to know return is from the three, you know, three different Part, right? Once something you already expected, right? And something can from what? From the announcement, right? Something unexpected happened, right? That also gives you return, right? Including the systematic part and the unsystematic part. And how can we use this concept in our diversification, right? Portfolio diversification is the investment in several different asset class. Or sectors, right? When we mention a different class or different sectors, we try to, you know, be more clear, right? The diversification is not just holding many assets in the, in this portfolio. Be careful, right? If you're holding many assets in the portfolio, are not means you do the real what diversification. Be careful, right? Why? Because let me show you the examples, right? For example, if you own the five airline stocks, right? They are all in the same industry, right? Same sectors. So when oil price surge, right? Your portfolio is not, you know, go doing well, right? And also you see, if you have the stock in the cruise or in the airline stocks this time, right? Because of the COVID-19, right? The cruise stock and airline stock, are doing very, very worse than before, right? So your stock portfolios are not what are not diversified. However, if you own 50 stocks, right, 
more stocks, right? But they also not in the same industry. They spy in the twenty different industries. Then you are truly diversified because you invested in many different industries, right? So one, when, when all your price goes up, maybe your airline tickets, uh, airline stocks are not doing well. However, like IT, you know, industries can still performing good. Right? So you not put all the money in a one basket. Right? You don't put all the bad eggs in one basket. Right? You spend your investment in different sectors. You doing what? You doing a diversification to reduce risk. Right? Okay. So based on our interpretation of the risk and return, now we can also make our risk into more details. Right? Total return, including the two parts. Right? One part is the city market risk. Once on city market risk, our previous measure used the standard deviations of return is a measure of what total risk, right? So this total risk including the two part. Want something from the market from the macroeconomic factors. Right? It's also called market risk. For example, right, like our you know inflation, right, GDP, right? And right and unemployment rate, right? All this is for the whole economy. Right? It's not specific to one industry. So this is called city market risk, right? Also called what? Also called market risk. Right? But for the other part of the risk is comes from what? Com comes from something you know, specific to your company or specific to your industry only, right? For example, right, like the oil price to the airline company, right, is a unsentimental risk, right? And some, you know, industry requires a high inventory, right? For example, the wholesale company, right? So this is also specific to one industry only, right? But for our well diversified portfolios, right, because we spend, you know, our investment in many different industries, right, our own sentiment risk, right, our own sentiment risk, right, this part, right, will be what? Will be very small, right? But this part is not, is always there, right? You cannot change, right? But for this part, with your diversifications, right, using the different industry stock, right, your unsentiment part right, will be reduced to be, to be very small, right? Consequently, a total risk for a diversified portfolio is essentially just, you know, equal to what? The city market risk, right? When our unsentiment risk is already diversified out, right? What you left remain, right, will be the city market risk, right? So our total risk for our diversified portfolio is equal to what? It's equal to the city market Risk. Or you can see the non what is you can see non diversified risk. Or you can see the what market risk, right? Market risk. Market risk can be not diversified out. Right? It's always there. Okay. So let me show you some examples. For example, right in these tables, I gave you you know the portfolio space right when you adding more and more stock into portfolios right when you have only one stock in the portfolios right your total risk for the portfolio is very high right it's about 49.24 percent right when you adding more stock into portfolios right you can see our risk are uh, continue what continue reduce right continue drop you know, in this column, right, the value dropped in this column, right, from the 49 to 20.24 percent, right, to 37, 29, 26, right, until what? Until about 20 percent, right? While you already have the 100 stock in the portfolios, right, you can see risk is now it's only 19.69 percent, right? Starting from here, right, you can see if you continue adding more stock, even to a certain stock, right, your portfolio's risk will be not reduced too much anymore, right? Will be only a small, what? Small change of the decimal part, right? But you know, if you're adding more and more portfolios, right? You need to 
manage these stocks, right? And you need to pay the, you know, some commissions, right? So when adding too many stocks in the portfolios, the benefits of diversification actually is gone, right? So you cannot even compensate with your commission, with your cost, right? So from this example, you can tell, right? You cannot increase in too many stocks in your portfolios, right? Because our diversification benefits will be, you know, reduced right? if you have the sufficient stock in the portfolios, right? If you continue adding too many, right? It's not best, you know, it's not benefit anymore, right? This part, right? For this part, right? If we adding more stocks, right? The rates are not gone, right? It's still there, right? This part we call what? We call our, you know, market rates, right? Market rates, right? Or you can say the systematic rates, right? Systematic, right? Systematic risk, right? These parts cannot be diversified out, right? So up about what? About 20%, right? About 20%, right? But for, you know, from the 49 to 20%, this part, right? Where we have the less and less total risk, right? Because our own systematic part, are uh, diversified out right, with the diversification, right? Your race specific to one industry, one, you know, sectors are reduced, right? But they cannot reduce to zero because we have the market risk is always there. So you can see here, right? Our diversification can substantially reduce the variability of the return. Without an equivalent reduction in the return, right? Return can still maintain, right? As the value you want to get, right? Reduction of the risk will arise because the worse than expected returns from one asset are offset by the better than expected returns from the other, you know, investment, right? However, there's a minimal level of risk that cannot be diversified away, right? This part we call a market proportion, or you can say, systematic proportion, right? And how we measure the unsettlement risk, right? We use the be careful. That's a very important term we will use for these matters, right? Even for the future investment class, right? We use this one a lot, right? We call this one as what? As beta, right? So we use the beta coefficient, right? To measure what? Measure the market risk, right? Measure the sentiment risk. A beta right, is a Greek letter, right? Use this symbol, right? So what the beta tells us about, right? A beta equal to one implies our asset has the same market risk as the overall market, right? If the beta less than one means asset has less market risk than the total market, right? If the beta more than one implies the asset has even more risk market risk than the total market, right? Here the market means the stock market means our what stock change, right? For example, S and P five hundred can be used as a market what benchmark, right? So beta equal to one, right? Most likely means your stock, right? In the you know for example in the public market, right? Has the same systematic risk as the whole S S and P five hundred market. Right, so when the whole market increased by one percent, right, your stock will be also, you know, increased by one percent, right. So they have the similar same risk, right, based on the beta measurement, right. But if the beta less than one, what that means? Means when the market moves, right, your stock will, you know, with the less volatility than the whole market. Right? But if the beta more than one means your market even even your uh, means your company even has what has higher risk than the total market. Right? Let's see some examples for the beta. Right? You can see here, right? The beta take different values, right? If the beta more than zero, right, means the company move in the same direction as the market, right? So if beta equal to two, right, means the market with the twice responsive, right, to the market, right, when the market move by one percent, your market will, your stock will move by two percent. You response 
with twice of the change of the market, right? If the beta equal to 0 0.5, that means your movement of the company stock, right? Price will, you know, just half as responsive of the market, right? Beta can be also a native, uh, native beta means the means the stock moving in the opposite directions to the market, right? So for example, if the beta equal to the minus 0 0.5, right, means your stock only responds with half, you know, percentage of the market. If the market with 1% change, right, your stock will, you know, moving in the opposite, right, with the 0.5%, right? For example, when the market increases by 1%, right, your stock, right, will reduce by what? By 0 0.5%, right? That's the beta what's the beta means, right? And what's the real beta? Right, you can get some beta right in the Yahoo Finance, right? So when you open finance.yahoo.com, right? And you can, you know, search for your, you know, for your company, right? Like a Google, like Microsoft, right? You can check the beta right in the company's profile, right? And then beta for the Amazon's, right? For example, is 0 0.82, right? And Microsoft is close to one, right? Because the, the Microsoft is the, you know, is the large players, right? In the market, right? So they have the very close, you know, risk to the market, right? And also Disney, right? Intel, right? This company has the, you know, close risk to the market, right? Which company has the high beta? I mean, it's much more riskier than the market, for example, right? The financial companies, right? They usually has the higher beta. Than the market players right, in the uh, stock change, right? And also the fashion companies, right? And the luxury companies, right? They has a high beta, right? Compared with the market risk, right? You can see the coach, for example, right? A and F, American, you know, American Eagle, right? AE, for example, right? The Quambi and Fitch, for example, these companies, right? Has the Beta right, is very high, right? Because that's not a necessity right, for most household. Right? There are so many substitutes, right? And also during the financial recessions, you are not, you know, possible to buy too much, you know, clothes, right? And too too much luxury stuff, right? So that's why you know beta for the fashion companies are high. You can go to Yahoo Finance right, to search for the beta for different companies. Right? Yahoo Finance providing the beta and also the other key information for different companies. Right? The other choice, you can go to the Bloomberg. Right? Bloomberg is available in our library. Right? Also, you can go to the online Bloomberg right, website to check the beta for different companies. Okay, so uh, now we can study how to you know, break down our total risk right into the two parts. Right? One is the total risk equal to what? Total risk equal to the sigma, right? It equal to the standard deviations, right? But our total risk can be also decomposed into the two parts. One is the systematic risk, one is non systematic risk, right? For example, there are two securities in our tables, right? Security C, right? Security C with the total risk, what? 20%, right? Beta, 1.25. Security B. K right with the total risk thirty percent right, beta equal to a zero point nine five percent or zero point nine five. So my first question is which securities right has a more total risk? We know our sigma standard deviations measures the total risk right. So who has a higher sigma? Say has a twenty percent right as standard deviations, but K has a what thirty percent right. So K has a higher total risk than C, right? Then which security has a more systematic risk, right? Which one measures systematic risk? Is the beta, right? Beta measures market risk, right? Measures your company's systematic risk, right? To the market. Who has a higher beta? C has a higher beta, 1.25. So C has a what? Has a more systematic risk than the K. Next one, based on this comparison, which securities right, in the table should have the higher expiry return, right? We know market risk right, is shared by every company right, in the same country, 
Right? This part cannot diversify out. Right? Whatever you have it, or you, whatever you are good companies or bad companies, you always have market risk there. Right? So there's no compensation forward. Follow what? There's no compensation for city market risk. Right? So you need to comp com compensate with what? With your company's riskiness, right, to the market. That's the part you should do compensation with what? With return, right? For the other city metric risk part, we can diversify out, right, use the diversifications, right? So, you know, if you can do a diversification, right, the non city metric risk part will be gone, right? So we will only compensate with the market risk part, right? So which one is the higher beta? C, right? C has the most market risk, right? This part can never diversify out, right? So this part needs uh, what compensation as the return, right? So the C has our uh, higher expired return, right? Uh, you know, our uh, fund managers, uh, all investors, right? If they choose the C and K stock into portfolio, right? They can use the diversification, right? To reduce the uncertain metrics by to zero, right? What left, right? In the portfolios is only in the what? Only in the market part, right? This part is request what? Request the compensation, right? So our C request what? Higher expired return. Okay, now let's check what's the portfolio's beta, right? We solve the portfolio's return and risk at the beginning of this video, right? How about whole portfolio's market risk, right? We can use also use what? We use the weighted. Right, average right to solve the portfolio beta right. So we use the weight times the beta plus weight times beta, weight times beta, weight times beta right to solve the whole portfolio beta right. You say if the four stock or four security shares the same weight, for example, all these four securities right with twenty five percent right equally right. In the portfolios, right? Then they are beta, right? Is what? Is the 0.25 times this one, 0.25 times this one, 0.25 times this one, 0.25 times this one, right? So that's what? That's the beta in total, right? Divided by 4, right? But our, you know, securities don't have the equal weight, right? They don't have the equal equal weight, they have a different weight, right, so that's why we need to times by the different weight, right, for each beta to solve what, portfolio's beta, right, weight times the beta, weight times the beta, weight times the beta, weight times the beta to solve total beta, right, for portfolios, right, so our formulas for the portfolio's beta, right, beta p equal to what, weight of each securities, right, times the beta of each securities, land to what, land to the summations right that's our formulas for the portfolio betas right okay so for the next video we will study what we will study the CAPM model capital asset price model that's very important part of these lectures but right? please take some time to review next lecture and uh, next uh, video in more details